said, this paper was somewhat technical. I tried to make it more, to have a paper which was more, you know, data oriented and stuff. And they did, they did analyze data, but the concepts are. The first time I so maybe what I could do for the uh, next time that I assign this paper is or, to, you know, okay, steer away from trying to do all this and like, explain all the information theoretically. So I could ask people to do it. Yeah, prepare people's minds for what they're going to do. For the topic, because you're right, it is a large field. <laughs> And since they mentioned it in this paper, without explaining it, we felt it was in your, that, that that was something that you had to cover. So that's a good point. I need to maybe very in my eye prepare people to present this. Is there any, I can find anyone that actually corrected for the multiply hypothesis test. Is there a way to do that? In, and still use some so, so, yes. Um, um, there, there, this guy, uh, Legendre, who does sort of biometric and text testing, has come up with a progression with correction the including type of uh, I haven't dug into it, and I'm not sure exactly how it works. Um, so, there are, there are, there are diehards out there who still think that there's a place for that. Compensate or you can have a way to correct for the worst problems. And then, there, and then there's just there's just the, uh, the old school that really just wants to do stepwise regression and points out that, um, <laughs> you know, how often you end up in the same model if you use the alternative approaches. So some feel that that's a good justification for continuing to use it since so it works and efficient and so on. But the response to that is, uh, you only get one model, you don't actually get a sense of what other models of the data is that people have uh, which is one of the issues that you mentioned. The contents of the tips are used uh, stepwise to work with uh, issues. So I, I see that as efficiency. Okay, let's um, let me start my lecture. So I'm going to cover some of the same ground, and I'll try and get a little bit more intuitive explanation, maybe, for some of the concepts behind uh, AIC. Although I'll not have time to dig into it in, in great detail. There's a, th this book by um, Burnham and Anderson has kind of become the book for consulting on these points. But then there's a simpler one by Anderson, which is slimmer and um, you know, maybe more accessible as a, as a first uh, reference if you end up having if you're deciding that these methods are for you. So I thought I would start like with a really simple, almost trivial example. And it is this. Every time you, know, you carry out a regression, you really face the, the question, well, how do I know what regression model to fit? I could fit a straight line. Or, you know, the data look a little bit curvilinear. I could fit a quadratic. How do you decide these things? <clears throat> so I thought, here's a, here's a data set, and I would apply this question, this problem, to uh, a very simple data set. How to decide how complicated a model to fit just to a simple scatter plot like this. And, uh, you know, typically we would say we would adopt a parsimonious approach, which is let's fit a straight line and, and not deviate from that true path until we have reason to believe otherwise. <clears throat> but the fact is, the quadratic regression would also be reasonable in this case. There is kind of some curvilinear curvilinearity in the data, <clears throat> and you might um, decide that 
Well, it's not a very strong curvature. Is it statistically significant? If not, I'll chuck it. You're doing stepwise regression already, even at this very simple stage. You might be doing it in your head, but nevertheless, you are thinking of things and then rejecting them on the basis of perhaps a p-value. But there's no need to stop at the quadratic. Actually, a cubic regression fits the data better than a, a quadratic or a straight line. <clears throat> Actually, a fifth degree polynomial fits the data even better. If your goal is to fit the data, then clearly you're better off fitting a fifth order polynomial than a straight line. Why not? Actually, I got to 10, 10 degree polynomial, and I couldn't fit the curve on the page, so, the, so a bit of it is truncated. It, it goes up <coughs> through the roof and then back down again to this one data point. <coughs> Are you impressed? I was. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I also, for each of the models that I fit, I, I, I started with a straight line, which is first order polynomial, all the way to um, 13 uh, degree polynomial, and I, I track the R squared, and the fit just gets better and better and better. And uh, not only that, but I calculated the log likelihood, assuming normal distribution of errors. And uh, I can show you from this graph that the log likelihood also improves the more complicated we make the model. The more and more terms we include, the more higher order terms we include. Isn't this good? Like if all we want to do is, is fit the data, describe this particular data set well, we're, we're done, I guess, at around 13. We, because that's when we run out of data points. <laughs> and, uh, and we can't fit more terms than there are data points. That's just an upper limit. So isn't, isn't, isn't this what we want? <clears throat> and so my question is, like, what exactly is wrong with this? Why don't we do this? What is the problem? Well, it's overfitting, right? You're making a model that, like, you can theoretically make a model that just mimics your data, but that's not describing what's actually happening. So, um, what do you mean by actually happening? Well, I mean, you're not, so my data, you're changing, not your focus happening. is now, like, I want to perfectly model the data as opposed to, like, I want to describe what's actually happening. What's happening, ha actually happening in nature. Right. I mean, that somehow, okay? It has a predictive value. Has no predictive value. Yeah. So that brings up another objective that was already discussed in the um, discussion earlier. That one of the other things that we like to do with data is to um, use it to predict. Um, and, uh, you know, another um, principle or another reason why we might feel uncomfortable fitting a 10th degree polynomial is that it's not minimum adequate model, but it's too complicated for the data. And, um, you know, there is this idea that's in Crawley's R book and is common, as uh, you found from the reading today, that models should be pared down, terms should be thrown out. But how do you decide which terms to throw out? And, um, um, you know, should you should you do null hypothesis significance testing starting at the 13 and just go all the way back until you can no longer uh, eliminate terms and, and use that model? Is that, is that how we should decide what to fit in this case? So there's the question of what exactly minimum adequate is and uh, how we get to it. Okay, and the, the Procedure of stepwise elimination of terms has already been described, and there's various ways of carrying out stepwise regression. But then we end up through this procedure with a model, the minimum adequate model, and that's traditionally what we would use. But the question that this whole area, which I think is still under development, uh, a model selection, it, it is asking whether this procedure actually leads to the best model. And the only way to answer that question is to first ask yourself, what do we mean by best model? So what is our criterion for best? And in the stepwise regression model, it's almost as though, well, we decide what's best according to what's minimal adequate. Well, what's minimal adequate 
the model that we get when we reject terms. And uh, so we don't really have a separate definition of what constitutes best from the method that we're actually using to arrive at that best model. The problem has also been pointed out in uh, the readings that every time you throw a model or throw a term out, you accept a null hypothesis. And that by doing so, you are potentially biasing your, your model. Because what happens if you drop um, a, a term from the model that actually should be there, that really does influence the y variable? Um, we would end up causing a sequence of type 2 errors, potentially. And is this likely to re lead us to the correct model? That's a good question. Also, how repeatable is the outcome? How often would we go out, is it the case that we go out to nature and collect from the same populations and run the same procedure that we end up in the same, with the same conclusion, with the same best model? And if we don't, what does that mean? And that raises the question which was also raised in the presentation, which is, is it possible that different subsets of variables might fit the data nearly equally well? And how do we find out what they are? So one reasonable criterion, which was just raised by Phil, is um, you know, a problem with the tenth order polynomial, polynomial is that it does not predict well necessarily. And so a reasonable criterion for deciding what model to fit is to ask how well does it predict, and to choose that as a potential criterion. So I'm going to apply this approach using something called a cross-validation score. And the cross-validation score is calculated as follows. So you fit a model to the data <clears throat> where um, the ith observation is removed. So take out the ith observation and then fit the model to the remaining data and then ask how well able are you to, uh, how good is this fit at predicting the one point that was deleted. So that's called uh, EI is the error of prediction from fitting a model that doesn't include that data point, adding it back. We take that error, we square it, and we sum it for every observation. And that I'm going to call that the cross-validation score. So it's basically the prediction errors associated with leaving every data point out one at a time. And so a larger cross-validation score corresponds to a worse prediction. Okay. <clears throat> So if I do that and I plot the log, in this case, of the cross-validation score against the degree polynomial, what do I find? That it's minimized for the linear regression. So the model that actually predicts best is the, the intuitive one, the one we would probably have begun with, and that is uh, the linear regression. Now, but the other thing I want to point out is that some of the other models actually do nearly equally well. And there's still the question of how we decide then which to remain, which, which of these models remain under consideration and which can be excluded outright. You know, surprisingly, a ninth degree polynomial did nearly as well as a straight line at predicting each data point one at a time. So, <clears throat> um, the idea of model selection, you know, going beyond stepwise regression, is to use an explicit criterion. And uh, one of the, 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 the one that uh, I just applied to the previous data set uses a, a prediction error. And uh, this graph shows um, what happens when you um, fit a model to data and then when you use that model to predict a second data set. Imagine Imagine a data set that you um, divide in two. And uh, you call the first one, you divide it in two randomly, and you call the first one your, your training data set. And then the, the, uh, the second one, you call the, what do you call it here? The test sample. So there's the training sample and the test sample. They both come from the same population. You've randomly divided them into two. And now your idea is you want to, um, to fit a model to the data and somehow come up with a model that uh, predicts reasonably well. And so as I showed you with the polynomial regression, the more terms the better. 
So when you're actually predicting the very same data that you're training the model on, um, you do uh, particularly well by including more and more terms. So predicting the, the data itself uh, is, uh, is easy. And I'm not talking about reduce, removing any uh, data point, but just leaving them all in there and asking which model fits the data best. And the answer is the most complicated model always fits the data best. And that's, in my case, the 13th degree polynomial. But prediction falls off. Prediction improves for a while. Of course, it depends on the actual situation. But then it worsens again as models become more complex. Why is this? Why does this happen? Well, the answer is that there's two things that cause um, poor prediction. And they, unfortunately, trade off. So, one advantage of fitting the most complicated possible model is that you end up with an unbiased estimate of every single um, parameter in that model. If the true effect of a variable is actually zero, uh, you may not get zero. I might not, like if the true effect of the tenth uh, order polynomial term is truly zero in the previous example, um, if I fit the model to the data, a ten, a fit a tenth order polynomial to the data, my estimate of that parameter um, will probably not be exactly zero. But what I know is that averaged over the long term and sampling from the population and fitting over and over again, on average, I will get zero if that is the true uh, um, coefficient. So um, making the model as complex as possible removes any possibility of bias, including everything. If you want to eliminate bias, that's what you do. But there's a second contribution to prediction, and that is how bad are your estimates of those coefficients? They may be unbiased, but if they're going to be way off, what's the point of including them in the model in the first place? Because your estimate, you only have a limited amount of data, and therefore your ability to estimate so many parameters is, is always going to be limited. And uh, that is called uh, uh, variance. So if you don't have a lot of data, my estimate of the coefficient of that tenth order polynomial term from run to run in repeated samples from the same population, the variance of that estimate is going to be enormous. And what that means is that on average, my coefficient estimate will be far from the parameter itself. And that reduces prediction too. And so there's a trade-off between um, bias, which is minimized this way, and variance, which is minimized that way. And, uh, the, the idea has been that we need to come up with a model selection approach that somehow trades these two off. If we want to predict the future, if we want to predict uh, another data set taken from the same population, then we're not going to include all the terms in the model, even if um, that's the only way to get a bi an unbiased estimate of those coefficients. Not only that, this is true even if the 35 degree model is the true model. In other words, the best model, the one that's best for prediction, isn't necessarily the true model. Because, again, fitting uh, all of the variables in that, that we might, for some reason, know to be involved uh, could actually be worse than fitting a simpler model. Worse for the purposes of predicting what's going to happen next year or in another data set. Um, the, other, the other thing about my 10th order polynomial is that I'm really data dredging. I have no clue why a 4th order polynomial term ought to be included in this analysis. I'm doing, you know, the equivalent of a QTL analysis. I'm just testing every marker that I have in the data set. I'm dredging. And uh, data dredging is going to um, generally lead to dubious results, unless, of course, you use a a method which is ideally suited to the procedure of data dredging, like formal QTL analysis. Um, <clears throat> even if you're trying to minimize a cross-validation score, maximize prediction, it's surprisingly surprising that the ninth order polynomial did so well. But I had no reason for thinking that the ninth order polynomial would be a useful term in the first place. And this kind of nonsense is bound to happen whenever you're data dredging, even if you're using a reasonable criterion. 
So what do we want out of an exercise like model selection? Well, we want a model that predicts well. I think we can all agree with that. Especially if we work at a government agency, that's mainly what we want. We want, we want to know how many salmon are coming next year. And to do that, we're going to measure a whole variety of things, but since we can't measure everything, we have to measure the key things. What are they? Well, we would also like to have a model that actually does approximate the true relationship between the variables. And by true relationship, I guess we're kind of getting into the realm of the causal relationship. If, if a variable causes variation, truly causes, we would like to, be, we would like to see it included in the model, if, if at all possible, especially if it has a large effect. The third thing, and this is kind of new to model selection, is, and, and something that stepwise procedures don't supply, is that we'd like to know something about what other models also worked well, because we can use that information too. And uh, finally, this was not brought up in the discussion earlier, but we'd like to be able to compare models that aren't necessarily nested. Stepwise regression only allows you to compare reduced versus full models. You can only compare statistically, and under the null hypothesis significance testing approach, you can only compare models in which one of the model has a subset of terms present in the other. But you can't compare models which have the same number of variables but different sets of variables and say which of those is best. That's something that stepwise regression cannot do, and yet that's what we want. Okay, so here's, here's how step model selection would then work. We would come up with a criterion that would have some of these ideal properties, and then we would, we would have a computational strategy that would allow us to find the best model. And uh, as was mentioned, there are, there are various um, criteria. And the uh, of CP and the AIC are um, pretty much the same thing under the circumstance that I'm going to um, apply it to. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more, uh, uh, more about what AIC is. But MALA CP is um, uh, a formula which um, attempts to estimate the mean square prediction error. So it's based on this prediction error concept. And uh, how it's calculated is basically the prediction error um, divided by a known variance term. And uh, you know this is sort of the prediction error component which we know that more complicated models always result in better prediction. But on the other side of this formula is this thing here, 2P. Two and uh, two P. And, uh, two P is um, twice the number of um, explanatory variables that are included in the, um, in the particular model, and it behaves as a, as a penalty. Every, every variable that you add to the model uh, reduces this, all else being equal. And so the mal of CP, as does AIC, ends up attempting to get a balance between being able to predict the data well and being penalized for the number of terms in the model. So it behaves like a penalty. And uh, we're going we're gonna to try it in the workshop on um, Thursday. So mal of CP is used as the criterion in the LEAPS package. And the LEAPS package does um, a procedure called all subsets regression. Basically, you give it a series of variables and it fits them all in all subsets. It fits everything. And um, so we're going to give it a try. This is true, this is data dredging at its finest. <laughs> um, but already, as was said, um, typically we have observational data and we've already made some decisions about which variables to measure in the first place. And presumably there's some biological basis for that. That we're not simply measuring absolutely everything. You know, we're, we're not necessarily counting all the rocks in your study sites if, if for some reason there's no reason to think that rocks matter to, you know, the density of swallows. Um, so we've already made some intelligent choices, but beyond that, we're employing model selection to basically test everything and then, and then see what's best. It's still data dredging, and so uh, we'll still find us something pleasing, but not necessarily uh, the truth. So here's a data set. It's uh, looking at the effects of three variables, latitude, elevation, and habitat, uh, and species richness. <clears throat> and uh, that's the data set that uh, I was going to toss into uh, LEAPS and show you how it worked. And so um, ha ha what LEAPS wants you to do is to fit a linear model, so we're already familiar with that. 
And my linear model is going to have those three variables that were measured in doll interactions, two-way and three-way interactions between them. It's honestly not a large enough data set to really justify this, but it's easier to uh, work with a data set of this size for the purposes of this demonstration. Okay, so I'm going to throw it into, uh, into leaps. Leaps requires that all variables be numeric, and so I can't have categorical variables in there, and so I did my own coding. Zero equals bog, one equals forest, and so that's how I included habitat. Not all the evaluated models are necessarily sensible, so leaps does not respect hierarchy. <clears throat> that's something that I mentioned earlier. Respecting hierarchy means that you know, no two-way interaction is ever fitted without both of the main effects of those two variables included in the model. No three-way interaction is fitted unless all the two-way and one-way interactions involving those variables are included. And uh, that can lead to models that might not make a lot of sense. But hey, as I said, <clears throat> this is data dredging at its best. So I, I tossed this into leaps to see what, uh, what I would find. And uh, what leaps <coughs> does is, uh, here's the number of predictors along the x-axis. And then uh, <coughs> here's the Mallow CP. And uh, leaps has some efficient method whereby it fits all possible models without actually fitting all possible models. But what it does try to do is find all of the models that, that fall below this line where CP equals the number of predictors. The idea being that below this line are all of the models that fit the data essentially equally well. Okay, so the, the, the best model <coughs> is this one here. It has four um, predictors in it. But there are other models uh, that fit the data nearly equally well, that have almost the same CP. And uh, CP is, um, I, and all of these models here, which uh, is a fair subset, a fair number, uh, all fit the data nearly equally well. There's the best model. In intercept of the three um, main effects, <clears throat> it turns out to be the, the, the model that minimizes Mallow's CP in this case. <clears throat> and then uh, here's all the th a, a summary of all 34 models that were fit the data nearly equally well. In other words, they had CP fall below this line. This line, uh, um, it's it's a it, it, I did a log scale, so it doesn't look like a line, but it's a line where where CP equals the number of predictors. And so all of the 34 models are summarized here. The best model has habitat, latitude, and elevation, and then none of the pairwise or three-way interactions. However, the next best model um, uh, had uh, no habitat term, but the latitude, elevation, and then habitat by latitude, pairwise interaction, and so on. I'm not going to go through all of them. My goal was just to show you, again, that um, there are a lot of models that actually fit the data reasonably well. And that's to impress upon you the fact that, well, so you found the best model, but what does that mean? If so many other models work reasonably well as well, um, also, as I say here. So if all you want to do is predict, then there's quite a few models to choose from. If what you want to do is identify the causes of variation in ant species richness, latitude or habitat or elevation, then maybe the interpretation of this set of models is more complicated. But in general, you know, regression is like correlation, it's not causation. So that's a tricky interpretation anyway. If you want to know whether A causes B, you have to do an experiment. So AIC has very similar properties to the Mallow CP. And uh, we're going to give this one a try, too, in the workshop this week. So AIC, the AIC formula looks very, very simple. And it looks so simple that you probably think somebody made it up. That, hmm, that maybe if we just took the likelihood on one hand of the model given the data, and then, you know, minus 2 times n, and then we just added 2 times k, where k is the number of explanatory variables, that that would be a sufficient penalty to produce a score that should lead to a trade-off between bivariance and bias, and, uh, and uh, leads to predictions. 
So that's not actually the case. An incredibly complicated theory <clears throat> was calculated in an effort to minimize information loss, where information loss is basically the difference between the prediction of the model and the, and the true model. And, and so it's very close to the idea of, a, of, a, of something that best predicts. <clears throat> that uh, model that minimizes AIC, minimizes AIC is the one that best predicts the truth. Not necessarily the truth, but it best predicts the truth <clears throat> for the data at hand. And uh, so when you look at it, well, this side of the equation is basically the likelihood. The idea is to minimize AIC. And the uh, AIC gets smaller and smaller and smaller the higher your likelihood. And as I pointed out in the graph earlier, the likelihood gets higher and higher and higher the more complicated your model. <clears throat> Uh, offsetting that is this term here, which is that AIC increases with every new term in the model. And so this term here behaves like a penalty. But I want to emphasize that this is its interpretation. It wasn't just sort of made up. Let's have a likelihood part and let's have a penalty part. This is sort of derived from a complicated theory that when you look at it goes, oh, I get that. This is, this is how you balance. This is how you balance, um, you know, the, the desire to fit everything uh, and improve the fit of the model to the data, the best possible fit, and the cost paid by having too many terms. Right, and as I said before, there are two reasons why models might predict poorly. And one is that they have too few terms. And, and, and uh, the other is that even though it might have all the right terms in the model, they're so badly estimated given the data at hand, that again, your ability to use them in prediction is, um, is also bad. And AIC is one way to balance these two sources of information loss. So, as I said, there's two aspects to model selection, and one is the criterion. And I've just uh, given you sort of an idea of what AIC is and how it works. And then the other is to have a, a method for actually finding the the model that minimizes AIC. And uh, there are, as you might expect, there are uh, methods in R that um, <clears throat> can do this. So one of the methods is uh, something called step AIC. And it's a, it's a stepwise um, method, but it doesn't use um, null hypothesis significance testing. It's just a procedure for, for uh, finding the model that minimizes AIC. One feature of step AIC is that it, uh, um, it, obeys these, uh, it, it obeys hierarchy, it respects hierarchy, or what uh, uh, the, the, um, the manual calls marginality restrictions, and that is that more complex terms aren't included unless the simpler terms of which they are component are also included in the model. So that's the difference between step AIC and um, leaps. It doesn't do all subsets. It does what the, you know, the makers of the program regard as all sensible subsets. Okay. And um, here's uh, the relationship between AIC and all of the models that um, I fit for the ant data. And um, as in the case of the leaps, case the the, the best model is uh, H. Is the model with the three main effects in the number of terms. But as I said, there's actually a range of models that fit the data nearly equally well. <clears throat> and then some of them um, fit the data very poorly. So if you leave habitat out, for example, the AIC, AIC score is much higher. This is relative AIC, and what that means is the best model is given an AIC score of zero, and all uh, the other models are uh, compared by their difference between the, their AIC and the AIC is the best model. So AIC difference is what matters in determining which model fits better, which model predicts better. So I want to, um, I mean, if you think all this makes sense, I think it makes sense. <clears throat> it's kind of interesting. But I want to just sort of take a, a pause here and um, reflect on what we've done here. And that is we've fit a model to data without any hypothesis testing. 
we have no null model as part of this exercise. There's no null hypothesis. And uh, since there's no null hypothesis, there's no p-value either. So we've gone completely outside of the traditional, conventional, statistical methodology that we all learned as undergraduates. <clears throat> no model is ever formally rejected, but some have much less support than others. Okay? So let's just have a minute of silence <laughs> for, the, for the death of the p-value. <laughs> It should feel good that we've done this, but maybe maybe it will start to unsettle you once you leave this room. It all seems so useful and necessary here, but think about it. You have not tested anything, and yet we have found the best model. <clears throat> how do we decide how much support each model has? Well, Bernard and Anderson say this is how. And that is that, uh, you know, any, any model which is within two AIC units of the best model is essentially fitting the same. That there's no distinction between them. All models within this range have what would be thought of as substantial support. Four to seven, considerably less support. Greater than ten, essentially no support. And, uh, well, if we're going to get rid of the p-value, we have to have some way of deciding what support level is, um, you know, is valid, makes sense. If we're going to use this approach, we have to all agree on degree of support. We all agreed, we were all able to agree on p equals 0.05, so there's no reason why we couldn't also come to an agreement on how to um, use this kind of information in deciding which models are worthwhile and which not. Any? Relative AIC score, you would have to think that would be the best model be set to zero, but that doesn't really tell you anything about like that model could be total crap. You might not have the best model even in your in your set of models. You might be missing the crucial variable. This method isn't going to tell you that. No method. So so some science is required a priori to decide which variables are likely to be the most important ones. And that could be based on previous studies of the organism and that sort of thing. But nevertheless, how you decide what, not just what variables to include in your model, but what variables to even mention in your paper, which is one of the moderator points, uh, is still, you know, what, still a behind the scenes decision. Is there another question that you have? So keep in mind, in this approach, your best model isn't necessarily the true model. It's the one that works the best. The true model, the one with all the terms, the correct number of terms, um, can be totally useless if you can't estimate it well. So it also takes some getting used to the idea that it can actually be better off leaving terms out that might actually be, might have a role if you can't estimate them well. So that's a, Okay, so why is there model uncertainty? Well, if you had an infinite amount of data, that there presumably would be no model uncertainty. And uh, so this uncertainty of for which model is correct really results from sampling error, which we're already used to. And uh, in, my, in my mind, the range of models that fit the data nearly equally well and those that fit less well but still have some support are, is, is more akin to the idea of a confidence interval than it is to hypothesis testing. There's really no analog in hypothesis testing. But there is in, in um, the idea of a confidence interval that we say, you know, when you estimate an X bar, you'll never get away with a table of X bars in a paper without some measure of the uncertainty. And what that uncertainty is, a standard error or a confidence interval, which is roughly twice the standard error, it's saying that this range of values fits the data nearly equally well. Like all of these still need to be considered as plausible values for the population mean. And this sort of extends that, I think, to models as well. So maybe walking away from p-values isn't that scary, because we do it all the time when we 
summarize our data in terms of a confidence interval without carrying out a test. So, um, as was mentioned in the presentation, another um, concept, another area that this approach is used is in model uh, multi-model inference. And um, what multi-model inference does is that it you know, tries to do things like estimate parameters that describe, say, the role of habitat by somehow including the information in all the models that have some support from the data uh, and, and estimating that habitat term by somehow averaging its effect in all the models that are still under consideration, including those models that don't include it. And then to do that, what's required in addition is some way of weighting the models by their degree of support. And I'm not going to talk about model averaging. Um, um, but I did want to point out that it is possible to um, carry out model averaging in, uh, in R in this particular package. And uh, it has a, a function in there, which I love the name of, it's called dredge. And, uh, and uh, that's the main command used in models of a multi-model inference. And Burnham and Anderson talk about um, multi-model inference. But now I want to talk about trying to go beyond um, data dredging. So, I mean, data dredging is somewhat of an unkind term. You know, I think of um, QTL analysis as true data dredging because we have no idea, really, where the genes are for a particular disease if it's the first study that's ever been carried out on this disease. And so you carry out a test using all possible markers in the, in the genome and um, make some progress that way. But even when you're trying to conserve populations of yellow hammers, you have some idea, based on previous studies, what variables matter and what don't. So a little bit of science is already incorporated into um, which variables you um, decide to consider and those that aren't even measured or part of the study. The danger arises when you actually had twice as many variables and you tested them all. Uh, but then decided they were not useless after that they were useless after looking at the data, and not even mentioning them in the paper. And this is perhaps the value of registering your the models that you're going to, to test ahead of time um, at, uh, at you know NIH before you before you get their money and um, and uh, actually carry out the study. But I think that the idea of model selection achieves its um, peak in utility when you're not data dredging at all, but when you are um, trying to compare models to data. And uh, these models somehow make sense biologically, somehow. And so you're not testing everything, every possible variable. You are just testing the ones that make sense and comparing them. And so that when you arrive at the best model and the other models that fit the data nearly equally well, you can say something about them. You don't have a list of 500 models fitting the data nearly equally well because you've already done some work to refine the hypotheses. And as was already mentioned in the discussion, this doesn't work for all fields, but it can work for some fields. It can work for all fields, at least sometimes. So I thought I would give an example of the application of this idea, and we're going to do one in the workshop this week as well. Um, I have since found another application of this method that I haven't incorporated into my lecture because, I don't know, a stickleback example is somehow a lot more intuitive than, than any other data set. But um, what this, uh, what this uh, data shows is a, a, a fossil sequence. So Mike Bell um, is a, a sort of an evolutionary, and, uh, uh, evolutionary paleontologist, and he's done things like excavate um, uh, fossils of three-spine stickleback from dry lake beds and so on. So these were from um, a diatomite mine in Nevada that was formerly at the bed of a lake. And uh, what he did was uh, he peeled through all of the layers and carefully extracted these, these slivers of skeletons of uh, dead stickleback um, and then measured uh, characteristics of them, and then also uh, you know, dated the strata. So it's, it's one of the finest stratigraphic records 
So um, the data set is a measurement of 5,000 um, fossils. And uh, time zero here corresponds to um, the first appearance of a, a stickleback in what was formerly a, a lake. So here's this lake. Stickleback, at one point in time, managed to colonize it, um, probably from the sea, but I'm not sure that's known. And um, the first measurements of the stickleback from that layer is that they have um, lots of armor. And uh, that's one reason why uh, you know, the marine form is the, the likely uh, culprit here, because the marine ancestral form is highly armored. And then what <clears throat> Mike Bell showed is that over time, the amount of armor declined and then you know, reached some sort of long term or at least the rate of decline slowed and got slower and slower through time. So this is number of dorsal spines, this is pelvic score, <clears throat> number of touching pterygiophore, uh, pterygiophores is something that Roy will have to explain. So Mike Bell published this uh, in a paper, I think in Evolution, and uh, what he did was um, he decided to fit a, uh, a null hypothesis to, to, to these data to see if he could reject uh, a null hypothesis of completely random evolution, completely directionist random evolution. And that's, uh, that's the model of drift. So the idea is that at every stage, from one stratigraphic layer to the next, the population of uh, stickleback can evolve in, you know, to the left or to the right. And under this particular model, the, the distribution of possible outcomes at every step is normal. And, um, what he was trying to do was to test whether um, it was just sort of like a, a random walk. Every, every time step, I move in a random direction. Uh, as I go forward, I move to the left or right, and the probability of my going in any particular distance to the left or right is described by a normal distribution. That's Brownian motion. And so I'm engaged in a, you know, a random walk. And uh, he carried out a, a, a test of this using all of the steps as independent observations and was unable to reject the null hypothesis with these data that, uh, that, um, that, it was, that the pattern of evolution was described by random genetic drift. <coughs> Which is surprising given how easily the eye picks up a pattern. <clears throat> but uh, I mean it seems like a repeated pattern but you know there might be the same underlying genes, who knows. So um, Hunt wrote to Mike Bell and said, "You're doing this all. You're doing this all wrong. You're not giving the alternative hypothesis a chance. You should not only have a, a null model described in this case as random genetic drift, but you should have an alternative model as well. And one alternative model that are uh, uh, frequently used in evolutionary biology is the model of adaptive peak shift." where a population colonizes a new environment and it adapts initially rapidly at first, but that as it gets close to the local optimum for that new environment, the process, the rate of evolution slows. And uh, that can be described uh, probabilistically by something called the ornstein ullenbeck process, but it really is just a model of adaptive peak shift. And it's uh, like a random walk, but if the optimum is over there, at every time step, I'm a little bit more likely to um, walk in the direction of that adaptive peak. And the farther I am from that peak, the bigger the step on average I'm likely to take towards that peak rather than away from that peak. Okay, so it's like Brownian motion, but there's a, there's, there's a direction, there's a, there's a pull. In the case of Brownian motion, there's only two parameters that need to be estimated from the data, and that is, one is where the mean was at the starting point, at time zero. And then the variance of this normal distribution that I described that, this, that determines the magnitude of the step at each, uh, each time. So the ornstein ullenbrecht process also includes a couple more, it includes uh, a couple more parameters, four. So initial trait mean, uh, the variance of the random step size each generation, the, where the optimum is, so that also has to be estimated from the data. And then the strength of the pull toward the optimum. Is it a very shallow optimum or is it a very steep-sided optimum? That will determine the step size. 
So the, there's a lot more to be estimated from the data in this adaptive peak model than in the Brownian motion model. And uh, what uh, Hunt did was uh, compare for each of these traits the, the neutral model against the adaptive model. So again, to remind you what was different about the, the uh, approach that Hunt was recommending compared to Mike Bell's original analysis is that an alternative hypothesis was specified and it was a, a model but also a, a relatively interpretable model, at least in terms of evolution. So here's the log likelihoods of the, um, the models given the data for each of these different armor traits in turn. And as you can see, the, um, the log likelihood is always better for the model with more parameters in it. But uh, when you take the parameters into account, which is something the AIC does, and uh, uh, look at the actual AIC scores, you find that even considering the added complexity of the model, in each case, the AIC score is substantially better. So in each case, um, the, um, the fit of the model to the data, uh, the adaptive model receives, well, that's the best model. And the neutral model, in this case, say for a pelvic score, would be, how much is that difference? 15? So that would be in the essentially no support category. Now I mentioned in, in the case of multi-model inference, uh, what is uh, uh, used to um, sort of integrate over all the models that, are, that have some support uh, from the data is to weight each model according to the amount of support. And that can be uh, calculated using something called the AIC, or the Akiaki weight. And so I'll show you how to calculate that in the workshop this week. But um, basically, it's a way of uh, measuring on a 0 to 1 scale um, the strength of support for the best model relative to all of the other ones. And uh, the idea is to generate um, a set of models that, are, that, that have at least some support and uh, provide an estimate of their weight, a calculation of their weight, and then to use that a little more intuitively to say, oh, this one has substantially more support than that one. And there's a probabilistic interpretation of this that uh, uh, Fiona mentioned in the, in the, in the presentation, but that, that's deep. We're not going there. Um, <clears throat> having occupied the high ground in um, extolling the virtues of the model selection approach, in uh, analyzing the, the Bell fossil sequence, they, they took a step down from the high ground and did a likelihood ratio test anyway, which uh, brought p-values back into the analysis. And they were able to do this because, in fact, these are nested models. The, the null model, the Brownian motion model, uh, contains two parameters that are also included in the, in the adaptive uh, peak model. And so it is possible to do a likelihood ratio test. And uh, I'm just showing this. I have, you know, I'm wagging my finger at these people thinking, you went the model selection way, you went to AIC, why go back? But it's useful to, to show you this result anyway because it differs so much from the uh, result that Mike Bell had obtained, analyzing the, the data the first time. In Mike Bell's case, he only had a null hypothesis. In this analysis, there's a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. And so, even if you're going to stick with the p-value approach, having an alternative hypothesis that's intuitive, that has biological meaning, is already a better way to go than simply having a, a null. So model comparison is a, is, a, is a valuable approach. In general, if you can get away with it, if you have enough knowledge or there are ideas out there about, you know, well, if it's not going to be Brownian motion, it's probably going to be something like this ornstein Hollenbeck. so let's try comparing it. In general, by the way, uh, yeah, you can generate a confidence set, a 95% confidence set of models uh, in this way using the Akiyaki weights by basically considering all of the models in your confidence set, analogous to a confidence interval, that have a weight of at least 0.05, uh, or whose who's, uh, uh, start at the best model and accumulate the weights until you get to 0.95, and that, that's your sort of analog of your 95% confidence set. Oh, yeah, this was, uh, uh, I already said this. Okay. 
So, um, we've shown that from, from their readings that uh, stepwise regression is not necessarily the best way to arrive at the best model. And uh, information theoretic approaches have been suggested and they have superior properties in, in many cases. Um, to use this approach, to, to, to be bold and to hold the high ground, uh, uh, means walking away from eBay and deciding what the best model is using other criteria more akin to what I think of as a confidence interval rather than a non-hypothesis significance testing approach. But data dredging is still possible. I tried QTL mapping once using an AIC approach and I found all kinds of models that were consistent with the marker data, but at the end of it I wasn't convinced that any of them were correct. Carry out a million tests and you're going to find something interesting. Um, and some models will be better supported than the other, but there's still, there's still this problem that you didn't really have a hypothesis to begin with. So, you know, it would be like my fifth order polynomial surprisingly fitting these beetle data really well. I have no idea why it should. And uh, so, some thoughtful science in combination with these alternative approaches is probably the best route to go. And uh, um, if you're interested in prediction, well, that's what this is mostly aimed at. You're trying to find the model that actually does the best prediction. If you want to be certain about causality, then you have to do an experiment. Oh, <clears throat> um, this is my uh, last slide, and it is just to say that there's something to be said for data dredging, as long as you admit that's what you're doing. And, uh, um, as I suggested last time, often it can be useful in these analyses, particularly if there are exploratory steps to say, the reason I did this study is I wanted to test particularly these two variables. Here's my test, here's my results. However, I also measured these other 12 variables, and now I'm going to throw everything in and just see what pops up as a heuristic procedure so that the next person trying a particular study will see whether any of these pop up again and, uh, and then, you know, down the road might be um, considered. So these are body uh, length data from um, fur seals. I got these data from Andrew Trites. And uh, the, each, each data point is a female fur seal. And uh, age of the female is along uh, this axis. and. Uh, body length is along the, the y-axis. And if you just look at the scatter plot, uh, you know, you probably fit this relationship with some sort of a growth curve that might have, you know, as complex as a second order polynomial, maybe a quadratic. Trouble with the quadratic is, as it goes up, then it has to come down again. But some kind of a model that's similarly uh, low complexity that has an asymptote, a michaelis uh, uh equation like that. And, uh, you know, I was all ready to do that and to use this, but then I thought, you yeah, know, I'm going to fit a 24-order, you know, polynomial to these data anyway. And uh, this is what I got. And uh, I actually believe this curve. It, it, it's true. It's repeatable. And uh, what it shows is that uh, female fur seals actually stretch and shrink each year. <clears throat> they haul themselves onto land to produce their pups. And this has the effect of, over time, the weight on land, in contrast to water, actually stretches their skeleton. <clears throat> so they actually get longer. And then when they return to the water after the breeding season is over, they shrink. I would never have discovered this with a puny second order, you know, polynomial regression. So there's something to be said for exploring data, because you might find new patterns, but to be sure about them, you'd have to verify them, presumably, in another study. <clears throat> Next week, we take some shots at p-values. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy this. And uh, so I have uh, two moderators already, and I have one presenter. So um, someone else would like to step forward. Present. So my understanding is Shahab is the only one that is presenting. No one else has stepped forward yet. So come on up. And uh, the presenters and moderators, um, if you have time, 
I can give you a spiel as to what to expect. Some tips on, on approaching your job. 